Hey everybody, welcome back to the Brand Design Masters podcast. I am super excited because today I'm here with Gabrielle Dolan. And Gabrielle is a speaker, author, and founder of Jargon Free Fridays from Melbourne, Australia. And you'll know that as soon as she starts talking. It's She's an expert in real communication and business storytelling and has been teaching people around the world the power of sharing personal stories in business way before it became trendy. In her career, Gabrielle's worked with some pretty amazing organizations such as the, the Obama Foundation, Visa, Accenture, Amazon, Uber, among many, many others. She's the author of seven books, including Bullet Points Kill and Other Deadly Presentation Traps, Stories for Work, The Essential Guide to Business Storytelling, and most recently, Magnetic Stories, Connect with Customers and Engage Employees with Brand Storytelling which debuted at number two on Australia's business books list. And with that, I welcome Gabrielle. Thanks, Philip. I feel like I need to do my most Australian accent considering you said you'll know it as soon as I start talking. But this is actually just my normal voice. Not my- <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So why don't you just share a little tidbit about your personal life let people get to know you a little better. Uh, yeah, so I live in Melbourne, Australia, as you said, so we're coming into summer here and uh, I live with my husband, Steve, and my two teenage daughters uh, who are 18 and 21, although my eldest teenage daughter recently moved out of home with her boyfriend and a few friends, so that's, uh, I feel like as a parent, I feel like, oh, I think my job here is almost done, I've sort of got them to adults and they're all good, and uh, we, like I said, we live in Melbourne, but we have a holiday property up on the southern New South Wales coast so it's about about an eight hour drive and we try to spend as much time there as possible so um, you know one one of the upsides and downsides of COVID is when borders are closed we haven't been able to get there but because of um, a lot of virtual delivery we can also get there now that they're open and I can actually work from there so um, that's that's me. That's awesome. So how does one become a business storytelling specialist? I mean, you started off in banking, right? Super corporate. Yes, yes, very super corporate. So um, it's a really good question. When I And when I um, speak to my kids about what job they want to be, I, I remind them that probably the job they'll be doing in 20 years doesn't even exist now, which is exactly what mine was. So yeah, I did, I did spend 20 years of my life in corporate in um, senior management roles, in change management roles. And I guess it was in those roles towards the, you know, the latter part of my career. So about 20 years ago, I started to realize that that when you started sharing stories to communicate, um, people actually got the message better and they understood it and they remembered it. And the more I sort of realized that myself, I definitely tried to utilize that skill in change management when you're rolling out change across a, you know, across a major, or I, w- I work for one of Australia's largest banks. So I noticed the impact it had. So about 17 years ago, like you said in your intro, way before it was trendy, I sort of thought, I think there's something in this. I think there's something in teaching leaders, um, front front line people, front staff, sales people, whatever, how to share stories to communicate more effectively. I I had. Um, already had experience in designing and delivering leadership programs. So I sort of thought this this is a leadership skill. It's a communication and influencing skill. So I left 17 years ago and since then have been teaching people how to do it. And um, I guess over 17 years, you build up your own level of expertise and um, intellectual property. And as you said, I've written seven books, which absolutely amazes me. Um, I actually failed English in my final year of school. So I think uh, I think my English teacher is, is amazed as well that I've managed to write seven books. So how did you fall into storytelling in banking? I mean, banking is so corporate. And I would think that if you're going to bite off storytelling as a motivational thing within a corporation, that would be like Mount Everest just to start with, making it more human because they're so inhuman. Yeah, yeah, I get that a lot, Philip. But what, where the where I work is that I work with individuals. So, say for example, a company is trying to communicate their purpose and values, and you know this is any company. The reality is there's leaders, individual leaders that are trying to do that, and. Um, it, it, it's when you look at the financial institution as a whole, they come across as they're not very human. But 
I've worked, I've worked in a financial institution for 20 years and they're some of my major clients. I, you know, I could list 10 financial institutions that are current clients. The reality is they're all made up of humans who are absolutely trying to do their best and, and everyone's trying to do their best and lead in a good way. Um, and, and that's what I do. So it's, it's, not like, it's not like we're coming up stories around banking. We're coming up stories around values. So, you know, if one of their values is trust or integrity or innovation and this is any company or customer service um, or agile or being brave or being courageous or being curious all the you know all the type of the values it's working with leaders on an to help them share personal stories of what that means to them and that's where you get that real human connection because they're talking about it from a personal perspective and not from a business perspective which is where most values rollouts, for want of a better word, go wrong. So I'm holding up for people on just the podcast and not video. I am now holding up Gabrielle's book, Magnetic Stories, which is a very cool cover, by the way, because the N acts as a magnet, kind of lifting up the R, which is a very interesting little design mechanism. So congratulations on that. Um, so how should businesses go about, you know, as Branding folks mostly who listen to this podcast, we are constantly helping our clients and uh, you know brand themselves, uh, establish their communication, um, their core essence of who they are. How do you go about finding the the authentic brand story? I mean, you have this you have this uh, URL um, uh, jargon free uh, Fridays, right? And I'd love you to explain a little bit about. Yeah, it's a really good question, Philip, and it's probably one of the reasons why I wrote the book. All my previous books have been on helping the individual share stories, and Magnetic Stories was the first book I wrote that's really helping companies share their stories. And whether they're large multinationals or whether they're just startups or, you know, entrepreneurs or small, medium enterprises, it's regardless of the company or industry, it's how to help them find stories. And you mentioned the whole, when you look at corporate stories, it's full of jargon. And that's one of the reasons I wrote it. I, I would see a lot of companies saying, this is our story. And all it is, is, you know, corporate jargon. Like, you know, we deliver, you know, best practice to help our clients, you know, meet their targets. And and it just, it's just, it was just like, what does it mean? It doesn't even mean anything. And it, it could be applied to any company. So, I think the way companies go around finding their authentic stories, as you said, and, and they should be authentic, is to, is looking at, well, what do you want to be known for? Like, what's the purpose of the company? What are your values? And also, why did the company start? So I think there's a, um, a missed opportunity where companies don't really go into detail about why the company started, but and base it on a value, like, a, or a need. Um, that's, you know, I, I talk about different types of stories in the book and I call that's a creation story about where, either why the company started or why a product started. So, and I think also the key, and then we can talk about this later, it's not just one story. It's not one story. And if it's, uh, and if you're talking about your story, don't make it a timeline of your company. That's one of the biggest mistakes. It's either full of corporate jargon that doesn't mean anything or it's a timeline. So, um, Timelines are not stories. That's fine. You can still have your timeline on your website, but just call it our timeline. Don't call it our story, which a lot of companies do. They say this is our story, and I, you know, nine times out of ten, it's a timeline. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about those, you know, those five C's in your book, the five different kinds of stories that you mentioned. Why don't we talk about those a little bit? So, what kind of stories can a company develop? Yeah, so when I, I I had I had so much fun writing this book, Philip, because I got I just thought I'm going to go out, I'm just going to throw the net wide and try to speak to as many companies as I can about the different types of stories they share. And so I sort of had no idea how many stories a company would need, but after doing that, you know, casting the net wide, I it sort of they fell into the like five categories. So to me, it's like the five types of stories. Now they all start with C. Um, yeah, there was that was coincidence, sort of. 
maybe with a little bit of tweaking on one of them, but it was coincidence. And the first one is creation stories. And that, that, is, a, that is a type of story that normally people might call it the founder story uh, or the origin story. But the reason I called it the creation story, not, not just to make it start with the C word, um, but it's also how the product started. So a lot of companies, so the creation story could be how a company started um, or how a product started and i think sometimes there's real there's a real missed opportunity i'm um, not sharing a story about how a product originated and and i can give you some examples um you know as, as we go through but I'll go, I'll go through them quickly the other one is the culture story so this is okay so what if these are our values what this is the, what i talked about before your leaders sharing personal stories to communicate those values so you know if your values integrity and respect and inclusion, then all your leaders should be pet sharing personal stories about what that means to them because that's gonna, that is going to create the culture. Then there's um, customer stories, so sharing stories about uh, the customers, but it, it's got to move beyond just a custom, customer testimonial. It's sort of making your customers the hero of the story and, you know, the, the relationship to you as a company, almost the subtle part of the story. Then there is community stories. So again, this moves beyond just your corporate responsibility, you know, sharing reports on your corporate responsibility. But it could be about um, perhaps your employees that are doing really great things in the community that have got nothing to do with your company, but it's just showing that your employees are, you know, really, really good people. Um, and this will often lead into the culture as well. And then there's challenge stories. So how, you know, what are the challenges the company has faced over the years and how have uh, how have you responded to that? And again, sometimes that brings in culture story. So it's very rare that a story is just this type of story. It normally falls over the different categories, but I would say as, as, a, as a business, as an organization, as a brand, try to find as many of those stories as you can because collectively all those stories will be your brand. So you talked in the book about deliberate versus organic storytelling. Can you just to tell us what that means? What's the difference between those two kinds of storytelling? What's deliberate storytelling? Yeah. Yeah, so I think that this applies very much to an organization as well as an individual. So some of this, you know, sometimes I do work with individuals on their individual brand. And you need to be aware that we all have a brand. Every one of us has a brand, every company has a brand. Even you like if you're in a team, your team has a brand. And whether you like it or not, we all have a brand. And the brand is um, my definition of brand, brand is the stories people share about you when you're not in the room. So it's a, it's a little bit of a tweak on um, Jeff Bezos' uh, quote of it's, it's what people say about you when you're not in the room. But I think ultimately they tell stories about you. So if we've all got a brand, we need that will be that can either evolve deliberately and strategically or organically. And so the, the whole concept is you probably want to take control of your brand and realize that and be more deliberate and strategic about it. So the deliberate aspect is if you want to be known as, say your company, you want to be known as innovative and um, trustworthy, let's just say, for example, then you need to be deliberately sharing stories about being innovative and trustworthy. So you need to be doing that. But you also need to be innovative and trustworthy. So it was like if you're dealing, you know, if you want to be known for exceptional customer service, for example, look for opportunities to deliver exceptional customer service. So it's being deliberate in the stories you share and what you do that creates the stories. So that's the deliberate bit. The organic bit is just being aware that if you're not, if you're not aware, like if you're not being congruent in what you say and what you do and what you do your brand could be evolving organically without you even knowing it so you know you can say we're this but if you're acting in another way then that will become your brand so when companies are developing stories or at least going out and kind of digging in deep and trying to find stories within their organization to tell who in a company is responsible for codifying those stories or capturing those stories and kind of making them, um, surfacing them in the organization so they can be disseminated to people to to tell? Yeah, look, at there's, um, 
in, in, on one way I sort of say everyone's responsible, but it's like if you say make everyone responsible, no one will be responsible. So it normally is, normally when I go in and work uh, in organisations, it's normally the marketing or the communications, uh, uh, sometimes HR. But the reality is everyone does need to understand the role they play in creating these stories and sharing stories. But there also needs to be a way of, well, how do we start capturing these stories? So, you know, you, you give you an example, I've worked with clients who, if, we, if we're going to do this well, the first thing we need to do is educate all the relevant people on how to tell stories well. So how to share stories well. And that part of that process is the understanding the power of stories. So they start finding them as in they start noticing, you know, for example, they could have one of their team members that, that does this, you know, lives and breathes a value. So there could be something, their value could be on teamwork and they've got a team member that just did a, you know, brilliant job of teamwork. Okay, so we need to, that's capturing the story, noticing it, but then sharing it. The, the, some of the capture bit can be really deliberate as in let's write the story down, let's perhaps record a video, um, let's share it in our induction program, let's share it on in a newsletter, let's get the CEO to share it at you know, the next meeting they have with the team. So it's, it's quite deliberate. But the most powerful communication medium every organisation has is the grapevine. And so if you, if you think of the grapevine as a piece of hardware, the software in the grapevine is stories. And no one needs to manage that. It's just like it because it just spreads by itself, as we know. So where I think the role of senior people is to is to share stories that go into the grapevine um, and share the positive stories that go into the grapevine. But I think it's really important, especially for frontline staff, to empower them to create stories. So again, if, if you want to be known as exceptional customer service, what are you doing for your employees to make to make them feel that they can go above and beyond and deliver exceptional customer service? Because saying saying this is a value and doing it is is very different. One of the things you mentioned in the book was a neuroscientist whose name was Carmen Simon, and you said that she says the whole purpose of the brain is to make decisions. And I found that absolutely fascinating. I never really kind of heard that observation before. So how does brand storytelling affect our ability to make decisions? Yeah, I, 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 first, I had the pleasure of seeing Carmen in a conference and she asked that question to the audience, what's the purpose of the brain? And everyone's like saying all these, you know, weird complicated things and she said no it's actually to make decisions it's like you know do fight or flight go this way or that way and I was like yeah that's a like <laughs> that's a good point and so if you work back from that she says the only way we can make decisions in is based on what we remember like if you don't remember something you've done in the past you can't you know mm. like last time I touched that red thing it hurt and it burnt me so I'm not going to touch it again so it's based on what we remember and she said, the only way you can, we can remember something is to get attention. So, and this is all making sense. It was like, you know, it's when you want to tell someone something important, you have almost got to get their attention first. Mm. And then she said, the only way to get attention is to engage people. And so to get that engagement. And this is where, you know, I, I use this both in storytelling or, you know, in presenting, we need to get engaged people to get their attention so they remember it, which then changes their decision in the future. And stories, there's so much research that show that stories help people not only understand a message, but actually remember it, which then influences future future behavior. So it's like, if you're, if you're leading a team, you wanna influence future behavior, so you're sharing personal stories. But, but if you're talking about brand and how you get your brand out there and recognition you want to get the engage it and get their attention and therefore influence their future buying habits i mean that that sort of you know and influence and that becomes brand loyalty there's um i'll give you an example of this philip it's 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 probably one of my most favorite stories in the book that i came across when i was researching and it was the um backstory of barbie so i Growing up, I was a real, you know, tomboy. I'd be on my skateboard BMX bike and I was never into dolls and I never owned a Barbie. And over the last few decades, when Barbie's sort of reputation 
cop a bit of a hit where it was like, you know, she was a bad role, role model for girls, this unattainable body image and all that. Um, I happily went along with that story. And, you know, I said in the intro, I've got two, you know, daughters, 18 and 21, and I never bought them a Barbie. And in fact, I think I told people not to buy them a Barbie. Hence was my, like, no, that's, that I was buying into that story. Anyway, the backstory of Barbie was that Barbie was, um, invented by Ruth Handler, who is the wife of one of the co-founders of Mattel that makes Barbie. And this is this was in the 50s. And what she noticed, that she had two children. She had a son and, and a daughter called Ken and Barbara. And yes, Ken and Barbie are named after her kids. And what she noticed when they were, when they were both playing with their respective dolls, Ken was encouraged to see himself as an astronaut or a firefighter or, you know, or, you know superhero, where Barbara... Barbara only could see herself as a caregiver. That's that's what the dolls were. And so she pitched this idea of Barbie being a 3D doll with clothes that they could change around and be anything. And, you know, initially she got resistance, but she persisted and um, Barbie debuted in um, 1959, the New York Toy Fair. And there's a quote by Ruth Handler that she says, my whole philosophy with Barbie was that through the doll, the little girl could be anything she wanted to be, that Barbie always has represented that women have choices. And when I read that quote, it was like I I completely changed my opinion of the Mm. brand Barbie, like completely changed it. And it was almost like this instant connection to the brand, which, which will influence my future buying habits. So I never brought my daughters a Barbie, but maybe any grandkids that come along, um, and I, that, that to me is what a magnetic story is. When you talk about magnetic stories, it's almost you have this instant connection that's very, very hard to pull away from. And um, I just, I had to actually work really hard to find that story. And I just thought, what a missed opportunity that that story isn't on every bar, you know, Barbie packaging and isn't front and center of their website and front and center of their branding because that message is more you know it's still relevant today and it would bring a whole generation along with them based on that that backstory i happen to know the vp of marketing of barbie so i'll pass that on to her All she right, used to be you. one of my creative directors <laughs> um so that's Maybe a gr- I'll send her a book that's a, a absolutely that's a great story by the way absolutely love that okay so now you went there you went down the barbie route and the clothes and everything so i want to talk about your shoes you told a story in the book about your shoes. It was an unintentional, undeliberate, personal branding trap, not even a trap, but just kind of a, a happening that, that just it, it developed its own life in your life. So I want to talk about your personal branding of your shoes. Tell us that story. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and this is very much linked to the deliberate and organic thing that we spoke about before. So when, when I left the corporate world, uh, and went out teaching storytelling. So remember, this is 17 years ago when no one was talking about storytelling in business. Um, I I didn't spend a lot of time thinking of what my brand, my, my personal brand would be, but I, wa- I knew I wanted the brand of storytelling to be professional, but different. So it was still very professional, but it was different. So that's what I wanted the brand of storytelling to be. And I think that sort of morphed into my own brand. So for example, when I do, you know, speaking and workshops, I'll be dressed in jeans and a blazer and and shoes. It still sort of looks professional, but I'm not in a corporate suit. So it's sort of professional, but different. And I came across, I, I, I'm not a shoe, I used to hate shopping for shoes. I don't know why, because I just never found shoes I liked. And I came across this pair of shoes. They're a Melbourne designer and I bought them and they're flat and they're a bit funky. And it was like, oh, my me and my daughter goes, no, buy it, go, go for it, mum, own it. And so I did buy them and then I wore them on stage and the amount of comments I got about these shoes, I thought, oh, this is good. And then they're really comfortable and flat. Um, professional but different and so I just started buying more of those type of shoes and you know and then it got to the point where shoes became part of my brand but because the shoes were you know they're beautifully well-made Italian leather shoes Melbourne design
And so another story that talks about like the uh, organic, but you got to be aware of it, is that I, I never really was into nails and I'm not into nail, like I don't have nail polish, but um, a couple of, well, early last year I got SNS and I don't, I was going to say Philip, I don't know if you've ever had SNS, but you probably haven't, but it's sort of like nail polish that's really hard. It makes, it makes you sound like you're typing really fast. But anyway, you have to go back to the hair, you have to go back to the nail place to get it removed. It's not just like normal nail polish. So I put that on for a couple of times and then we went into lockdown. So this was in March last year. We went into lockdown and everything was closed. And as a bit of a joke, I put on my Instagram, you know, the, a photo of my 10 nails going, I wonder how long these will last. And then every week I gave an update with, you know, seven, <laughs> two fell off. I've only got seven. And to me, to me, it was a little bit of fun. But then within about three weeks, I started getting people tagging me on post about fake nails. Now, first of all, the other part of my brand is authenticity and being real and being genuine. And nails, it's not even, it's not even my thing. Like I've had it done, I'd had it done for about three months of my life. But within weeks, people had been tagging me. And I just thought, I don't want to be known for fake nails. Like I, I just, it's not, it's not my brand and it's not, I just don't want to be known for them. So I actually stopped posting about it and I even did one thing more I actually removed the post from my Instagram account now at the time I was thought I was being a little bit you know taking this whole brand thing a bit seriously but when I and I wrote about these two stories in my book and when I gave my um, draft manuscript to a couple of my senior clients one of them said I must admit when I when I saw your Instagram post around the fake nails I thought to myself that's so against brand and so I, wow. I thought I was being a little bit over the top, but I, my clients at the time, that's what they were thinking. So you, ne you need to be really careful of what you're doing out there. Well, you have done an amazing job of building a personal brand, probably way before building a personal brand was trendy either. So I want to ask you, what... How did you go about that? What were the platforms you chose to really kind of dig into deepest in the beginning? Obviously, you're, you're an author. You've written seven books, so that's you know doesn't go unnoticed. But what other kind of platforms, social, what kind of marketing have you engaged in in order to build your brand? Yeah, look, I think there's a couple of things. So I, I do, I write regularly on LinkedIn and do posts. So it's getting out there. I do, I, I play a little bit with Instagram, but it's not, it's normally personal stuff. So, and I don't, and I actually never really advertise, you know, and market on your pay for marketing on the social media channels. Um, you know, when I write books, I invest a little bit in marketing at airports and um, billboards occasionally and stuff like that. But I think, I think, the marketing your brand is a day-to-day -day thing. It's a day-to-day -day interaction. And it really goes back to what do you want to be known for and and finding opportunities to live and breathe that. So re really quick example, my, my brand and our company brand is um, be easy to work with. So that's one of our things like, you know, be add value to me, it's add value and be easy to work with. So when sometimes you'll get clients to say, oh, can you sign this contract? And it, there's a, some wording in there that I think, oh, I don't really, not really okay with that. But you know what, I go, I oh, just, whatever. It's like, it's it's so minimal and I don't wanna be picky about it. So, so if we wanna be known as easy to work with, we just go, yep, that's fine. Um, I've, you know, I will have clients that have booked dates for workshops and they, for whatever reason, they need to change. And I know a lot of other people in my situation would charge them for that. There would mm. be a fee for changing the date at the last minute. And I just go, you know what? No one's done that deliberately. So that's fine. And so it's just, so it's when you're, when you're forced with a decision, is this going to reinforce your brand of being easy to work with, or is it going to go against your brand? And so to me, know what you want to be known for and then go live and breathe that and actually look for opportunities to do it if you know if you want to be known as being generous um look for opportunities to be generous with people so you know i, I do that all the time where there's you know books on my website that are for free because i just think oh you know what just just have it for free not not all of them, not all of them not <laughs> oh, oh, wait. Are, but, yeah <laughs> 
So, I mean, you have an amazing career. You have a, incredible books you've put out, an incredible presence online, and a, a client list to die for. And so, from the outside, absolutely sparkling. What kind of challenges have you um, kind of come up against in your in your movement up to the top of this field? Yeah, so, and you're right, Philip, it's a lot of where I am now and people looking in go, wow, you've got an amazing life. And I do, I, I, I have a... I have a life by design, and um, I, you know, and I've sort of stayed true to that. So, but starting out seventeen years ago, like no, no one was buying storytelling. Like, like mm. seriously, I'd have people laugh at me. They're going, "Hang on, you left your senior corporate job to teach people storytelling? Like, a, what, what is that?" And so, the the challenges at the start were really hard. It was. I remember after 12 months of doing this, I paid myself $500 because I thought I don't want to go a whole year and not earn any money. And so I, you know, so when you look at, you know, if when you're a senior leader in corporate and the next year you earn $500, it'd be fair to say that's a significant drop in salary. So the first couple of years were really hard just trying to educate the market. Um, you know, again, and especially working like in the industries and any industry, it was um, just scoffing at the concept of storytelling. Mm. So that was hard. There have been times, uh, you know, when I left my corporate career, my husband fully supported me and said, if that's what you want to do, um, go for it. So, um, you know, we were financially okay, but the reality is you're still dropping 50% of it. Well, it was probably 60% because I earned more than him. So you're still making a joint decision to drop 60% of your income together. And probably one of the biggest challenges I had, it was probably about eight years ago, my husband was really hating his corporate career. He just wanted to get out and he, he wanted to just be a maintenance man. And so again, he had a senior corporate. He goes, I just want to work with my hands. And I remember thinking, um, okay, I think I need to take this seriously. I think I need to really grow the business so we're in a financial position where he can leave. So that was a real challenge over the next 12 months. And it got to the point where he did resign. So he resigned from his corporate job. And at the same time, I'd asked a friend of mine to come and work as my full-time assistant who was a primary school teacher. She actually taught my kids. And she said yes. And I remember going to the accountant and thinking, two people have left their respective careers based on the fact that I am going to be successful. And it, it seriously nearly made me vomit, <sighs> like this this pressure of pain. And I was like, I, just, I still remember that feeling. Um, and, and but yeah, I, that sort of lasted a few days. It was like I was going to my friend, are you sure? Are you sure you want to leave? And she goes, will you stop saying that because it's making me nervous? And then I sort of thought, okay, I just need to believe I can do this. Um, and and yeah, but you, I mean, you have challenges. You have you know tricky clients and stuff. And then you know when you get successful, um, I always say that you know the the key to success is saying yes to a lot of things. And, and then I think the key to remaining successful is saying no to a lot of things. So mm. having the courage to say no to work. Um, I said at the start we've got a. Um, a property on the New South Wales coast. So I made a decision quite a few years ago when we bought that, that I wouldn't work school holidays. Um, and in Australia, we have 12 weeks school holidays a year. So like I just say no to work. So I could made a decision to spend it with my family. Um, and you know, that, that can be tough to do that life by design, but it's, to me, it's absolutely worth it. Well, congratulations on that. That is, that is very intentional. I applaud you for that. Um, so it sounds like you were working on work-life balance before a lot of other people were too. <laughs> so, so in coming up, I mean, because you were very much on the vanguard of brand storytelling for corporations, very much an OG in brand storytelling, um, how, what kind of influences did you have or what kind of mentors did you have or, or people that you held up as people that you um, aspired to be? What, what did that look like for you? So in, in my corporate career, there was a couple of uh, leaders or people that I reported to that I had a, a lot of respect for. And, you know, at, at the time, you don't know why, you just think I really like working with them. But looking back, I could see that they were, um, they were, they were authentic, as in they were really real. And the other thing I think what I loved about them is they believed in me and they would put 
my needs ahead of perhaps their needs or the company needs. And, you know, the, the first the first leader I'm talking about is he gave me a go when I moved out of technology, um, only working in IT all my life, and then he, he um, gave me an opportunity to come and work for him in training and development, which, you know, I look back now and that was a critical critical path because I got into this whole how do you design and deliver training and um, the other leader she literally I was went for a job and she didn't give it to me she actually didn't give it to me and she sort of said what are you going to do and I said I think I should leave and she goes I think you should leave too she goes you've sort of been talking about running your own business and and I think you should go do it it's you know there was I'd been there for 17 years and so these these little pushes you know when people believe in you before you believe in yourself I think that's what I look at there's certainly my early um mentors and even you know my parents did that you when parents believe in you like say you can do it you can do it so that's what I really admire and respect in people and then since running my own business I've had a couple of mentors that have also done the same that have also believed in me before I've believed in myself and have shown me how to how to do that and how to grow my business so I think um I, you know, I, and I think almost that's the job of a leader, really, isn't it? Whether you're a parent or you're leading a team, to see potential in people and give them the courage and confidence to go for it um, before they do. And I think ultimately that's what good leaders do. I agree with you. I mean, as a creative leader, my whole career, I've done exactly that. And I do that now in my own business with um, with my followers and community, um, try to empower them to improve and grow. I had the same experience myself. I mean, I had two different managers, one on the corporate side, one on the agency side, who kind of took me under their wing and, you know, gave me challenges when I needed a challenge or gave me a kick in the butt when I needed a kick in the butt. And on the, uh, I think that... Um, that's something I would encourage our listeners to pay attention to is who are their champions where they're working? Who can they, um, you know, ask to, to, to be their mentee so they can find somebody to kind of like help forge their way. Cause I think that that's very important for yeah. things, people to kind of focus on. So Gabrielle, it's been great talking to you. And I warned you in advance that I was going to subject you to the rapid fire 10, which is a new uh, kind of little rapid fire questionnaire that I have for people. So if you're ready, I'm going to hit you up for the first one. I'm ready. All right. Number one. I'm excited. And I'm, I'm de- and, and should we tell the listeners, you warned me in advance you'd be doing this. I haven't been warned in advance of the questions. So That's this true. You do not know the questions. Right. Okay. Number one, what's your spirit animal? Dolphin. Morning person or night person? Morning, definitely. Beach or mountains? Ooh, I'm going to say mountains, even though our property is on the beach, but I I, I don't particularly like sand or seawater. Okay. Cat person or dog person? Uh, Neither, but we have a dog, and if I had to choose, I'd do dog person. So what's your secret talent that most people don't know you can do? Um, I am this, can I add two, I'm brilliant at jigsaw puzzles. Like seriously, I'm a brilliant at jigsaw puzzles. I can do jigsaw puzzles so fast. That's my little okay. secret talent. Favorite song of all time? Oh, this is so hard. But let's go. You know what? I get, you know, the Spotify thing is the songs. And the most played song I had was Dolly Parton's 9 to 5, which <laughs> it's on my running list. And I think it's, I wouldn't say it's my favorite song of all time, but I'm, I'm going to Spotify thinks it is. The song you've listened to. Spotify, yeah, Spotify thinks it is. And I okay. think because it's on my running list. So, yeah. uh, your favorite place in the world? My veggie garden at Bermagui, which is the the property we have on the southern New South Wales coast. So it's got a massive veggie garden. It's the first thing I do when I'm there is go down into the veggie garden. Number eight, what's the one thing you would love to master? Oh, is this a question that stumps everyone? Um active truly active listening but i reckon i've been working on active listening for a long time and i know i still don't get it right because i'm so impatient mm. which is like 
I just want to jump in. I want to jump in and tell people what I, I can see what you should be doing. <laughs> so yeah, it's that really listening. Number nine is who is your hero? I'm going to say, I know this might be really cliche, but I'm going to say my daughters because they're, I'm really, really proud of them. And they've, you know, especially the last couple of years, they've done, like, it's been a crap for kids growing up, you know, in this pandemic. And so they've come out the other side pretty, pretty switched on and pretty amazing. And finally, number 10, what's the one thing you would tell your 20 year old self? Um, I don't know what the key to success is, but the key to failure is trying to please everybody. Mm. Oh, I love that. That's a really good one. And that actually could fit into my final, final question, which I ask everybody, which is, do you have a personal mantra or manifesto that you try to live your life by? Uh, yeah, I do. And it's do work you love with people you love. That is awesome. So that is a, life, that's a great one. Yeah. Life is too short to not do work you love. So Gabrielle Dolan, author of, I will hold it up again, Magnetic Stories, among six other books. Oh, there we go. Stereo. And um, thank you so much for talking to us today. Where can people find you? If, you want, if people want to get in touch with Gabrielle, how do they do that? Yeah, so all the socials we talked about before, LinkedIn, um, Instagram, if you want to follow my cooking post. <laughs> um, but if you go to my website, gabrieldolan.com, um, everything's there. And there's actually a free storytelling starter kit. So you'll easily see that on the website. And it is what it is. It's um, it's free. And it, you'll get an a email from me with a sh really short video for every day for a week. And it really is aimed at just getting you started, just getting you started thinking about where you could start sharing stories, what types of stories you could share. Um, so that's a good place to start. Well, Gabrielle, thank you so much for coming on the Brand Design Masters podcast and speaking with us today. I hope you'll come back and join us again soon. I would love to, Philip. Thank you for the opportunity.